So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to week three. I um, was saying to the group this morning, this is the, uh, on the, on the Thailand ride, this is probably the time where you start to, your motivation starts to wane a little bit and, um, and you start to think, well, is, is the end in, where is the end and, and is it on its way? So um, congratulations to you all for, for getting to this point. Um, I think today marks the official halfway point and, um, and we just love the commitment from everyone to, uh, to ride the kilometres, but also raise the dollars for our kids. So very big thank you to you all. Today, we're riding the fourth and final leg of day four. So as you know, the last few days, we've been riding day four from Bangkok to Chumpon. And, um, and so today's ride will finish at um, a hotel that some of you will know as the Rest Hotel. Um, Nana Beach Resort. So we spend um, a couple of nights there while we rest and recoup and get ready for the, the last four days of the Thailand ride. So that's where we're finishing today. And, um, and to help you get through the case today, we are joined by Pete, uh, sorry, Pete yep, and Paul. <laughs> Great, Pete with <laughs> double P's. Um, we're joined by Pete and Paul Watkins. Now, a little bit about, um, little bit about Paul before I hand over. So despite being a self-confessed non-athlete and scientist, Paul has managed to compete in and win some of the world's toughest races in the world, as well as build multi-million dollar businesses in multiple fields. Paul has climbed some of the toughest and most iconic mountains across all seven continents. He has climbed, trekked and adventured in Tanzania, Argentina, Alaska, the Arctic, Antarctica, New Zealand, Papua New Guinea, Jordan, Nepal. Wow. Yeah. He has also managed to race in some of Australia's and the world's toughest ultramarathons, including being the only Australian to win the 614-kilometre, and I don't know if I said it, 6633 Arctic Ultra. Spoiler. And in the business world, armed with a little more than a pharmacy degree, Paul became a business owner, starting small and eventually building and running a multiple-site pharmacy business with over 60 employees. Wow, this is going to be an amazing This will chat. be epic. This will be epic. So I'm going to hand over to Pete and Paul. G'day, Paul. How are you going? G'day, Peter. I feel lazy. Everyone's riding. I'm just sitting here. I feel like I should be on a treadmill or something. I'm doing no fitness whatsoever. Yeah, if you just spin your chair around, Paul, uh, just remind yourself of how lazy you are and have a look at some of those images <laughs> on your wall. And, well, I just uh, kind of just look like I'm riding every now and then. You'll think I'm in. I'm doing it. <laughs> That's all I'm doing. Yeah. That's all I'm doing. There's hey, nothing uh, happening below uh, the screen. Straight up. Yeah, that's right. Straight up, I need to uh, offer uh, our collective uh, congratulations to you. Um, Thank you. And that's, uh, that's on the back of uh, uh, graduating uh, of, at uni with $8 in your pocket. I think that's a remarkable thing. Most people I know leave with the debt. So well yeah. done to you. <laughs> That's the advantage of working two part-time jobs while you're getting through a year and you're left with eight bucks and a really average Holden Gemini. I love that car, <laughs> but that's all I had. And with a blue, a pale yeah. sky blue, was that right? Yeah, you know, I don't know if you remember the old, where the blue would fade, you get that really light sky blue and then you had that lovely beige interior. It was, it was my first car, I loved it. Yeah, nice. And uh, how long did you keep that for? Until uh, I wrote it off about two years later. <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, well, that's the story of most uh, uh, young adolescent men, isn't it? How they get, get rid of their first car is uh, they crash it and uh, hopefully we, we survive. Yeah, unfortunately, someone came through an intersection and, and one of us didn't notice the, uh, the appropriate signage and it was the end of my car. Thankfully, no one was hurt apart from my feelings and my ego, but that was about it. Yeah. So um, uh, you left uni with a, uh, as a pharmacist um, and uh, you describe yourself uh, firstly, as a nerd, and I have a, I have a problem with that. Okay. I, I can't, I can't think that anyone's done what you uh, have done, and are allowed to call themselves a nerd. I think the the collective nerds would uh, expel you from the nerd community. Yes, I'd be removed from the Harry Potter fan club. But I assure you, the glasses are relatively thick. Um, <laughs> no, look, I, I was definitely a nerd. I mean, I left high school and I was, you know, debate club, theatre club, chess, you name it. Um, and I went to a, a private boys' school in Melbourne. I was a scholarship student. Um, and they, they lauded themselves on their football and cricket. I was there not long after Warney was there. So cricket and footy was a big deal at that school. And I was terrible at both of them. And if you didn't 
excel at those sports, your social currency was a little lower. Uh, but I was definitely a nerd yeah. when I left. Uh, and I thought I'd be, you know, I was convinced I was going to be a doctor, but I missed out on getting into medicine by one measly point and my entire life took a left turn into pharmacy and, and you know, kind of the, the rest is history. Uh, but I've, I've always been, uh, in my mind, a non-athlete. My sport of choice was always endurance, just mainly running because I was coordinated enough to do it and it didn't require being selected yeah. for a team so we could avoid all that uncomfortableness. Uh, and that's kind of just it evolved from there. And, and so when you're flying, because these days you're uh, a property mogul, you're a business advisor, you're an adventurer, you're a keynote speaker, you're all these wonderful things, but there's only a small amount of room on that immigration card. What are you putting mm. down as your occupation? There is. I, I like the fact that, you know, when I was in high school, I thought my business card would have one word on it and say, you know, Paul Watkins doctor. And I, I look back now and yeah. my business card got Paul Watkins and it's got about nine different things on it. And I love that it has that because each of those things bring different value to my life and different stories and different components. I mean, the one job that I have at the moment that you didn't mention is I'm a stay at home dad. I've got a, a two and a half year old uh, and a four and a half year old. Uh, two boys and my wife's a, a full-time school principal, primary school principal. So a lot of my day-to-day -day week is taking care of our two boys. And I love that, that we're in a position to be able to enjoy that time with them. So I love the diversity that, that having all those little bits and pieces of careers um, allow me. I often joke, I'll ring my mum and she'll be like, oh, what are you doing, Paul? I'm driving a forklift, mum. She's like, why are you driving a forklift? You have, you have a master's degree. What are you doing? Like, drive a forklift. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so you left, left uni, um, you, you've got, got your uh, pharmacy degree, you, uh, I assume you uh, start working uh, in a local pharmacy, is that, is that how it pans out? Yeah, it kind of, it's one of those things, I'd love to say that my life had this beautifully planned out step-by-step -step plan and it's never happened like that. I, I went yeah. to work in normal retail pharmacy in the southeastern suburbs of Melbourne, had a chance meeting with a couple of guys one day who was setting up a pharmacy group in, in rural Victoria, tagged on and then left Melbourne as part of kind of following a career with them um, and found myself in Warnable, which is a seaside regional town in Southwest Victoria. Um, and I bought a pharmacy, a really small pharmacy, had a couple of staff and the gentleman I bought it off said, you'll either be here for one year or the rest of your life. There's no middle ground. And I said, look, mate, I'm here for business. It'll be one year. We're going to fix this place up and I'm out of here. Uh, and that was 20 years ago, <laughs> and I'm still here, um, you know, married, two kids, acreage, and I'm, and I'm going nowhere. So he knew a lot more than I did. Um, but as a pharmacist, I was a, a reasonable pharmacist, but it turns out I was fairly, uh, probably better at the business side of it. Uh, and within a few years, I found myself with uh, multiple site businesses, 60 employees, and all of a sudden I'm working, you know, seven days a week. We're open 365 days a year and, you know, I always say to people from the outside, it looked great. You could see me go, here's someone who's really successful. Um, but from the inside, I look at going, here is someone who is just abjectly miserable. Like I was just working myself into an early grave. And, you know, you can have all the money and success in the world, but you can't take it with you. Um, and I had that moment of crisis of going, what do we do here? Is this, is this the end? Do we just keep doing this until you retire and that's the end of it? Um, and that's how I got in, got back into to running and getting back into health and fitness, uh, which eventually led me into mountain climbing um, as, a, as an escapism from working far yeah. too much. And, and the running side of it, um, was that something that, uh, was it a, a natural transition into the ultras? Was it something that you, you know, you started doing the, the tens and half and full and then the longer we all were, where, how did that transition occur for you? Uh, probably non-traditionally. So I started out just doing basic cross country running because I enjoyed it and just, you know, running around town and those kind of things. Um, and as part of trying to re get some stress relief from work, um, I decided to go do the Kokoda track. My grandfather in World War II had fought in the Bell in New Britain, uh, just off the coast of New Guinea. And I wanted to retrace his footsteps. So I went back, did that, did the Kokoda track while I was there and really loved it and thought oh, this is this is rejuvenating for me this is this is something i'm doing for me that's giving me you know some time and some ability to get out of that work mindset and focus back on my own health 
So you do that and then I thought, oh, what do you do next? And, and I went and did a small trek in Nepal because I thought, great, Himalayas, no email, no fax, no phone, no internet, that'll be great. And it just one thing led to another and then I did a bit bigger trek and then I did a basic mountain climb and then did something bigger and bigger then kind of a few years down the track, all of a sudden I was climbing some of the biggest and, and iconic mountains on, on the planet. And I enjoyed it and I loved that and I did that for the best part of a decade, but I, I'd reached a point where the climbs were at a, a level where, you know, I would ring my then girlfriend, now wife at the time and go, hey, you're going to read some stuff on the internet. I'm on the sat phone. Um, you know, there's been some incidences that you're going to hear about some people that have died and, you know, but we're all okay. Everything's all right. And, you know, I'll be home again. It'll be okay. And you, you reach that point where you go, the risk or rewards kind of changed now. So I came back and, and, and hung the boots up for a while. You get married, you have kids, you have responsibilities that are about other people than yourself. Um, and that's when I got back into running. And then, as you said, that, that chain of events, you do a five, then you do a 10, then you do a half, and then yeah. you do a marathon, and then you do an ultra, and away you go. I'll come back to the uh, running part of it. You've uh, talked about uh, the epic uh, climbing that you've done. What have you learned about uh, relying upon yourself, equipment, and others uh, when you're in these epic uh, life and death clients. I think there's some really good lessons. There's so much value and lessons to be learned from these kind of adventures. And I also say to people, it's so important you have adventures. It doesn't have to be epic in scale, but adventures give you an opportunity yeah. to learn a lot about yourself. Um, so probably the, the key pieces of advice I've got, particularly with mountain climbing, don't look at the whole mountain. You have to break it down into little parts and deal with each little part. If you stand at base camp and you look at the summit and go, that's enormous. There's no way I will ever get there. Then you're right. Um, whereas if you look at what I need to do to just survive the next hour or next half day or get to camp tonight, those little pieces, you break it down into parts, it will add up and you will get the job done. In terms of teamwork, it's really different because it's, it's almost non-cooperative teamwork in a way. You meet people who are all type A and all want to get the summit um, and you've never met them before in your life. You have two days with them, maybe at a base camp, and then we're tied together, like literally rope to rope, because we have to take care of each other in glacier travel. And my life is in your hands and your life is in my hands. Um, and we all want to summit. But if I can summit and you don't, that's kind of, you know, that, well, that's just how it happens sometimes, as long as we're all safe and we get home, so be it. So it's really non-cooperative team play in a way, which gets really interesting. So you have to focus on not only managing yourself, but also learning to manage the expectations and behaviours of others. Um, and I think that takes a great degree of self-awareness uh, and humility. So it's taught me a lot to sometimes not make those judgments of people, those, you know, re check the cover and assume you figured out the book, really take a moment to step back and see it from someone else's perspective. And the equipment, equipment is great and it's super crucial, but it's only as good as the operator. So you, I always say to yeah. people, you must do the work. You must learn how to use your equipment in a manner that is realistic. Um, and I've learned that the hard way where, you, you know, you work at home in the comfort of your lounge room going, oh, I've got this great sleeping system with my sleeping bag and all these kind of things. And then you get out on an expedition, you discover that whilst in theory it's great, when it's minus 40, the zip will break or anything that's, you know, plastic will snap. So all of a sudden all your training was irrelevant because it wasn't realistic. Uh, so I think that's been a, yeah. a good lesson as well. What about when you talk about the preparation and and then uh, testing things under real conditions and so forth? And we had uh, a guy, uh, Cam Mostyn, who joined us uh, last week for a chat, and he was part of the four-man crew that rode across the Atlantic, and uh, uh, they were the fastest Australian team. They came second in that year's challenge and mm. and uh and he was talking about the same that there's just things that you can train and prepare for but until you're out there you just yeah. you can't simulate it no. and that's it and that's where it and comes you, back to do you have you trained yeah. the most important tool that you'll take with you uh, and that's having that mindset that if you've done the work and you've prepared as best you can both mentally and physically and you, you know your equipment well, and you're prepared for whatever comes your way, then you're more likely to be able to deal with it. I explain it to people this way. You can train 
uh, as a specialist or a generalist. And the generalists will often, I find, have greater success. You need to have a certain level of proficiency and skill with the techniques and the equipment, but you need to have a broad and deep toolkit. Um, I've been on expeditions where I've trained very specifically for what I thought would happen. And then you've gone on the expedition and it didn't go anywhere near the way you thought it would happen. Um, weather issues, health issues, equipment issues, whatever it is. And all of a sudden you find your toolkit was too small and you can't solve it. Uh, and I've learned to have a deep toolkit so that no matter what happens, if it breaks, falls apart, it didn't turn up, it didn't make the flight, something's gone wrong, whatever it is, that's okay. You're okay with that because mentally you're prepared for it and you are ready to adapt and roll with whatever you need to do. There's a talk about, um, like from a physical point, like if you're training for a, a road marathon, for example, there's no need to have run the 42. If you, you know, there's no need mm. to have done it, tested at all. And, you know, whether it's been in the success in the business or uh, the expeditions or whatever, there's a point where if you wait until you've got all of the answers to all of the possible questions, you'll never start, you'll never leave home because you're still researching, still. For you, a uh, percentage point, how, wh where do you go? Good to go uh, from this point. I think that's really partly up here uh, in terms of yep. most of us are in a position where we know we have to have a certain degree of physical preparation. And I would say, you've got to have the, the engine right. And you also have to have the chassis right. There's no point having a huge engine if the chassis is going to fall apart five kilometers into yep. the race. So you need to have the the keys ticked off in that regard. But a lot of it is, do you have your head in the right headspace and the right mentality to tackle this? And if you do, you'll cover a lot of the small bumps that will no doubt come up along the way. Um, I mean, I've, I've done races where you physically can't test the, the distance. Like if you're going for a race that's five or 600 kilometers in length, you can't go out and test run that. So you just have to prepare as best you can and have a really good understanding of what your capacity is. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges in those races is, and I've done this right and wrong, is you turn up and immediately start benchmarking yourself off the people around you versus going and going, I know yeah. what I need to do to achieve what I want to achieve. So I have my plan, I'm going to stick to it, rather than turning up and being derailed because that guy's passed me and that person's passed me. And I should be able to keep up with that person and I can't today. It's really about, I know what I'm capable of and I know what I'm here to do and I'm going to stick with that and not be derailed by the behaviour of others and suddenly benchmarking yourself against them. So at what point did you start uh, uh, the expeditions and then the, the long ultras and so forth? Um, at what point did, uh, did you, <laughs> sorry, we've got a, a house phone, a landline. A lot of people know uh, what that is, but we've got one of them. At what point did you start embarking on uh, the ultra distances uh, from a marathon point of view, the ultra marathons? Yeah, I kind of put my climbing boots, hung them up kind of, it would be oh, probably about eight years ago now, I needed to have a break from there and then got back into running because you, you, I stopped the mountaineering because it was really at that peak where the, the risk reward was getting too much that I was yeah. not comfortable with it. Um, so you've got those hats on, you know, you're a dad and you're a businessman and you're doing this and you're doing that, yep. but you're still you, you still have your own identity and your own need to go out and do these things that are important for no other reason than they're important to you. And whether that's, I think you've described it before as food for the soul. Sometimes you need to do those things and use that to come back and be better in your roles as, you know, partner or parent or, or whatever it is. So I got back into running to do that. So yeah, fives, tens, got into halves and got into ultras. Um, I find I love trail running. I'm a huge fan of trail running, not a massive fan of running on the road. I just really enjoy getting out into those environments. Um, and I find that road running for me, I mean, I'm mid forties now, so I find road running breaks me up a fair bit. Whereas getting out on the trails and out in the bush, it's restorative. I really enjoy it. I think it's really, really important. Um, and did that and just was kind of looking for challenges and something I could do and I, and I came across this race in the Arctic Circle one day just in across in social media I went that really piques my interest you know at that stage I climbed in all seven continents but I'd never been inside the Arctic Circle I thought this is a fascinating opportunity to kind of tick that book and it's not an altitude issue I'm not going to be hang off a mountainside somewhere and you know be risking life and limb doing that um, 
and that's how I ended up in uh, racing in Northern Canada in 2017. And and before we get there, because it's uh, obviously that's uh, such a um, an amazing uh, race and. Uh, uh, the 6633, is that how you describe it? 6633? Yep, yep. Spot on. Okay, before we get there, there was a, a quote that you had uh, paraphrasing John Muir, and I read that, and, and I think it just speaks to the point around uh, the trial running. And, and we've got uh, a number of people uh, that we've interviewed this, over the couple, last couple of weeks. Uh, have, have come from trial running and mm. there's this real growth I see in the sport yeah. and uh, people finding it's such a, a beautiful community and uh, mm -hmm. such a nice way to be out enjoying your exercise but uh, you know the quote that you have you're paraphrasing John Muir and you say over civilized people are learning wilderness is a necessity, it's a necessity. Yep. <laughs> talk to me about that and what that means for you Oh, I think it's so valuable. It's it's very easy today to get sucked down the rabbit hole of immediacy and short termism and just being buried in the the now and delivering what has to be done immediately. Um, and I think that ability to get away from that, and particularly for me, and and as you said rightly, a lot of people now are finding that 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 connection of wilderness and nature and being outside is bringing people a lot of value. And I think part of the value is. I mean, you can get all technical in the evolution and the biology of it and going, your body recognises that of being outdoors in nature and the, the sun and the fresh air and those kind of things. But I also think it gives people the chance to buy themselves some mental and emotional time. Uh, if you go out for a trail run, 5, 10, 15, 20, whatever you do, I always say, don't put the ear pods in, don't try and achieve work while you're out there, just go and be present in that area. And it forces you to find some time mentally and emotionally to decompress. And I, I think people find themselves trapped in losing the ability to decompress a little. And, and that has consequences. So I think there's, people are finding the value in that and going out and just expanding out in nature and reaping the benefits of that when they come back into their real world again. And I think because of the, the very nature of uh, trail runnings is that, uh, um, time, unless you're a, an elite uh, athlete, um, mm. the time that it takes you becomes less important. If we run on the road, we're measuring ourselves against the last run and the split times. And but you get out into the trails, and because they're so different, mm. the importance of uh, you know, the time per K yep. kind of slips away, doesn't it? And you become more immersed in the physical environment. Yep, I always joke that I can't afford to look up when I'm running on the trails because I will trip over the smallest branch or pebble that's on the trail, guaranteed. So you really do have to focus on what you're doing and be present in the moment and in the environment. And particularly on runs that you don't normally do or a race where it's a trail you don't normally do, you don't know what's coming up. So you just be present and enjoy it. And you're not trying to, oh, I've got to get to that corner. I know this is a bit where I'm going to accelerate or wherever it is. It's a case of going, we just deal with what's present and, and enjoy being present in that place and in that time. All right, so let's, um, uh, let's share uh, 6633. Um, it's, it's, not a, it's not an old race, is it? It does, doesn't have a lot of history. It's, what, 10 years, is that right? Uh, I think next year will be their 12th or 13th running. Yeah, it's only been going for a little over a decade and they've had a, a couple of years where it didn't run. So they've, they've been running for about 12, 13 years now. Yeah, and it's, it's a tiny boutique race. No one's ever heard of it. Um, but I, I didn't go there because it has, you know, a name or is well known. You know, Killian Janae is never going to turn up to this event. Like it's, it's a really, there's no prize money. There's no accolades. You know, it's tucked away where there are literally no people. Like it, it's well and truly out in the wilderness. But that's part of the reason that it attracted me. And it's a 614 kilometre uh, race, if we can call it that, and it's an unsupported race. So paint the picture of uh, what your expectations are around uh, climate, duration, how long you'll be out there for, and uh, what kind of gear you're carrying, and yep. is it, you know, you're dragging a sled behind you. Give us, some, give us a picture of what this is about, Paul. 
Yeah, absolutely. So this is in northern Canada. So you're right up the very far end of Canada. Uh, and you start in the Yukon at a place called Eagle Plains. If you've ever watched Ice Road Truckers, that's the road we start on. So we're way up north. Um, it's a 614 kilometre race and it's what they call a purist event. So it's single stage. There's no, you stop at night and camp here or whatever. We literally put you on the start line. We point you north and we say, you have nine days. You have 215 hours to get from here to the finish line, which is at a tiny Inuit village, a little Eskimo village at the end of Canada, way up in the Arctic Circle on the Arctic Ocean. And the clock runs 24 hours a day. So if you want to sleep, pull over to the side of the trail and put your little bivy down and have a sleep. If you want to eat, eat. But you have no support crew. Uh, you will receive no support from anybody. There is a medical crew that will kind of travel from front to back and front to back to keep an eye on you. Uh, and there are checkpoints along the way, but the checkpoints are very specific. We guarantee hot water if the fuel hasn't frozen or we can fire up the stove <laughs> and shelter from the wind. Now that may be a building. It may be Steve's car and a thermos. Like it, 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 it varies greatly. Yeah. There's nowhere to sleep here. It's a case of going, you can get some hot water. You can get out of the wind a little bit. You can't sleep here. And then you continue on at your own pace. So you really are under your own devices. Uh, you have a sled, you must be self-sufficient. So food, safety equipment and so forth. It's got the thinnest mandatory gear list I've ever seen. Equipment and supplies yeah, right. sufficient to survive in minus 40 for extended periods of time. <laughs> and, and you interpret that as you will. So yeah, right. I, I, had, I towed a sled that had about 20, 22 kilos of food and safety equipment in it when it was fully loaded, uh, which is fine on the flat, uh, terrible when you're crossing an entire mountain range, but it was what it was. Yeah. Uh, Weather-wise, good day, minus 15, minus 20. Bad day, how far do you want to go? This year they got down to kind of minus 50, minus 55. Um, you can get catabatic winds, which are these winds that come out of the North Pole and just slam straight into northern Canada and right up in the Arctic Circle there. Um, but the flip side is... It's beautiful. You're inside the Arctic Circle. There's no human habitation, the northern lights, you've got the wildlife, and it is absolutely picturesque and beautiful. Um, what what time of year is this? It's really harsh. Yeah, what time of year? This is early March. So they're just coming out of winter. So as we travel okay, north, so how we're, we're getting, light? the daylight was pretty good. You'd get, we kind of started off with about 10 to 12 hours of daylight a day. And you kind of moved a few hours as we traveled further, because we're basically heading straight north. Um, so as you got further and further north, you got a little bit more daylight as you went. Um, so you're coming out of winter, so it was, it was fairly reasonable. And uh, um, you talk about the, the difference in temperatures from, you know, minus 15 and minus 20 through to minus 40s and so forth. I'm assuming, you know, the gear that you've got, you, you have to have you know, the best gear. Is there a real difference uh, for you, you've got the layers, you've got all the protective gear on. Mm. Are you really noticing the difference uh, between a minus 20 and minus 40 day? Yeah, you kind of do. It's really strange. And I think you've got the gear on, you've got the clothing on, so that's protective and you, you, you're you aware that you, you're managing to keep fairly warm. It's really about how you operate yourself um, and how you manage the logistics of what you're doing. So simple things, if your shoelace becomes untied, you know, in normal day-to-day -day living, that's not a major crisis. If it's minus 15, yeah. you can grab your gloves off, get some dexterity and tie your shoelace up and you're fine. If it's minus 40, you've got 15 to 20 seconds to deal with this issue. Um, so gloves off, tie yeah, right. the shoelace, gloves on, run. Get the heat, get the, the fingers working, get the blood pumping. Um, simple things like all your food will freeze solid. Um, most of your fluid will freeze completely unless you have it well insulated or a means to make sure that you can rewarm it and those things. So logistically things become very, very different from a minus 20 to a minus 40 and how you manage it. Minus 20, sure. you know, you can have your face, Balaclava, you can have your face exposed. If it's not windy and it's fine. Minus 40, any breath of wind, any exposed skin, you're risking frostbite injuries almost instantaneously. So it really is about how you manage yourself in that environment and the degree to which that varies. And so what did you learn? Let's, let's uh, uh, firstly uh, revisit 2017. Um, what was that experience like for you? And what did you learn uh, from uh, a DNF in 2017? 
Yeah, I, I learned so much. <laughs> um, yeah. So to put that in context, the race, they only take about 25 people per year, just because logistically that's all they can kind of keep a, an eye on. Um, and it has an 80% DNF rate. So one out yeah. of five will make the finish line. They've had years where no one makes a finish line at all. So you know that there's a very good chance you're not going to get the job done. Um, I learned an enormous deal. I made it... 250 kilometers into the race in 2017 before I reached a point where going any further was completely nonsensical whatsoever. Um, I was hallucinating wildly from sleep deprivation. Um, I had not eaten anywhere enough food because it had all frozen solid. I hadn't prepped it appropriately. So, you know, you don't eat, so you get tired. You get tired, so you get slow. You're too slow, so you can't afford to stop and sleep. And you begin this downward spiral into, into nothing. Um, Having said that, look, we started with 23. I was one of the last to drop out and the remainder uh, six people fin ended up finishing the race. But I came away from that um, and I was comfortable in that I'd done everything I could. You know, I felt I trained well and I, I threw everything I had at it and came away with it going, I made a lot of mistakes. I made, a lot, I made nearly every mistake in the book. And I came home and I thought about that and realised that, well, if you've made every mistake in the book, you now know the perfect way to yeah. do it because you literally just need to flip the book over and go rectify those things. Like you have the knowledge and the experience. So you can look at it as a DNF or you can look at it as going, it was a, a painful and expensive training camp, but it has well prepared me yeah. to go back and do it properly again. Um, and that's really the mindset I took coming home going, what did you learn? Now we're going to write a different story. We're going to write a better story and we'll go back and do it again. So I competed in 2017 came home, licked my wounds, you know, packaged my ego, my shattered ego back together and then decided to go back and recompete in 2019 and, and tackle it in a very different way. And is it part of what I'm hearing there, Paul, uh, being a scientist, it's not as though um, you didn't analyse and chart and do all those <laughs> things that a, a nerd would do. Um, oh, beautiful leading in. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> Is it, a, is it a case that there's a lesson there that uh, uh, for all of us that sometimes you can't learn the lessons we learn, we need to learn until you actually get in there and have a go? Yeah, absolutely. And I think if you have the mindset that failure is a normal part of the process from time to time, and that is okay, it allows you to integrate all those lessons in a positive way and then use them positively moving forward. So rather than looking at, I've failed and therefore I'm a failure or I should have never done it or I didn't belong there or writing it off. Really coming back and going, okay, what did I learn? It was an experience. I've got a great story. What did I learn rather than looking at it as a failure? What did I learn and what can I now do with that knowledge to write the next chapter? So I really think it is that process. And I, I talk to school kids a lot about this, just going, failure is part of the process. And the sooner you accept that you're going to fail, and that's okay, it just makes you normal the easier it becomes to move past the stigma of failure and just integrate the lessons and keep moving forward. I, I, I don't know. I challenge the, even the language around 2017. It, it's a classified as a, a DNF, but mm. even in your own words, it's, it can't be a failure, can it? I know, and that's a good point, I guess. And, and it's described as that in the terminology, I guess, of the, the industry. But you're right. It's, if you want to look at it as a failure it'll be a failure for you. But if you want to look yeah. at it as an experience and a training and, and a lesson, then it'll be whatever you decide to, to evaluate it as. And it's a good point. Yeah, the industry loves to call it a failure, but the reality is it's whatever you want to take it as. Yeah, because you don't, probably, perhaps uh, you don't go on and uh, win the event in mm. 2019 without the lessons from 2017. Oh, absolutely. There's no way I could have done what I did 2019 and without having gone in 2017 and learnt some of those very harsh and valuable lessons um, at that time I just simply I, I would not have been the same person if I had not gone there and and had the event that I had in 2017. Well because in, in the business world uh, Paul when we have people who try and maybe don't have the success that they set out we don't call them failures we call them entrepreneurs no. don't we? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's right. Move fast and break things. I mean, that's that's okay. And it's that that mindset of how you frame it. You know, was it a DNF or was it just part of the? You know, it was a training camp, but I learned a lot, and now we're going to use it 
to be better again. Yeah, yeah. I want to take you to uh, something else that you uh, quoted as saying or you've written about, and it's adversity, exposure, and solitude. Mm -hmm. um, they're some of the moments of your, your greatest honesty. Yep. Talk to me about that. I often say to people, I think hardship, and I'm talking about healthy hardship, so not the things that are unexpected, you know, come out of left field. I'm talking about sometimes putting yourself in some hardship which is a choice today um, in kind of modern society yeah. has a lot of value for us. It's very easy for us to take the easier road. And I think it's really important that we take the road that says, I'm going to go get uncomfortable because there's a lot to learn from that. Uh, and I think for some people, I think there's a lot to get from having that adversity or the healthy hardship in solitude and in some silence and some quiet time. As I talked about earlier, it's very easy to just have the volume turned up in modern society. It's on 11 all the time from everywhere. Um, and there's great power in finding a way for you to create space. And that space is time away from that volume knob to 11. Um, and it might be going for a trail run or your bike ride or meditation or whatever it is. But it's really important to find that space to allow you to decompress and, and have that quiet time and use that to come back and be better at whatever it is you're doing back in you know, the real world, so to speak. So I think solitude is really important and, and having some healthy hardship, and most people get that through kind of physical adventure, is really, really valuable. And I think it's becoming more and more valuable as we move forward. Oh, Paul, I couldn't agree more. And particularly with the, the age groups, that we see that mm. with our Thailand bike rides. Now, they're 800 Ks in eight days. And, you know, compared to what you've done, it's uh, nothing like that. But it doesn't have to be, does it? You know? and, no. and we see, we see plenty of people, um, age bracket that you're talking about, who, you know, have been successful in their careers, raising families. Exercise hasn't been part of their life for a long time. And they might have had the team sport and they might have had that real adversity yep. where the option is not to step off, yep. you know, that you have to continue. And we see the strength of relationships and the growth in individuals mm. when they're faced with adversity. You certainly realise what you're capable of. And I think that's one of the values that I've found both in mountain climbing and in some trail running events I've been in. Mountain climbing is a great example. You can get three quarters of the way up the mountain. And if you have to pull out for whatever reason, that's fine. But you don't yeah. just take a step to the left and go back to the hotel. It's like you're still three quarters of the way up the mountain. It might still be two weeks to get off yeah. the thing. So you've still got to dig deep and deal with where you're at and the immediacy of what's going on. Same with trail runs. I've, I had... Uh, um, I tried around the Alpine country in Victoria and it was a, an 80K race. And I, I got to the 50K mark and missed the cutoff by about five minutes getting to the checkpoint. And I said, oh, what happens now? And the guy says, well, you're out, but you just keep going. So what do you mean? He said, well, you're still yeah. at the finish line in the middle of nowhere. So I said, I've still got to do the whole distance. What happens, well, what happens if I get to the, whole, to the end? He's like, well, you got cut off here, so you just don't get a medal. <laughs> You get a DNF, yeah. but you still have to do the whole distance. So I think those, yeah, those yeah. healthy hardships really do teach you a lot about what you're capable of. Most people are very fast to undervalue or underestimate what you can actually do. Yeah, it's certainly something we talk about with our rides. We have people who look at it and say, they have to raise $10,000 mm -hmm. um, and pay for their expenses on top. Yep. And they have to ride 800 Ks. And people you know, often will say, I couldn't do either the fundraising or the couldn't ride that far. And you go, if that's a story, Yep. You're telling yourself you're probably right. Yep. Yeah, and often say to people, the, the stories that go on up here are the most important ones. And you are in charge of that completely. You're the director, you're writing the script, you're the main star, you're everything. So how good or bad you want that story to be is often entirely up to you, particularly for us in kind of a, a modern society where we have the luxuries that we have. That movie is entirely up to you. Um, so it's like that thing. If you look at the whole mountain from base camp and go, I, I'll never get to the summit of that. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. If you go, can you raise 500 bucks? Oh, yeah, I reckon I could do that. Well, could you do that a few times? Oh, I could do that a few times. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, let's just chip away at it. And if you can ride, yeah. 
I always say, if you can run one kilometre, you can definitely do five. And if you can do five, you can definitely do 10. If you can do 10, you can sure as hell do 21. So don't look at the big picture. Look at the little parts we can deal with and do those and let them stack on top of each other. And then they go and have that experience and come away and go, damn, I did that. Yeah, you did. Yeah. We, we have a saying, we say, don't ride the hills until you get there. Yeah, <laughs> and it's true. Like, don't, don't make it harder than it has to be. Go and enjoy it and have that experience and be present where you are than worrying about the stuff you haven't even got to yet. You, you'll have time to worry yeah. about that when you get there. The hill will wait for you. You talk, you talk about times and, and DNFs and so forth. Um, on the last Friday of this series, we've got a guy by the name of Mickey Campbell mm -hmm. uh, who's uh, having joining us for a chat. Nicky did the, uh, the solo race across America and yep. it's a 4,600k ride or so forth and yeah. and uh, the time frame, I think it's 11 days or 12 days or something like that Oof. and um, he was five minutes after the cutoff. So he's he's uh, he's a DNF. <laughs> yeah. and, and no one in, in their right mind would ever look at that and class that man or that effort as a failure. So you've really got to be careful the labels we allow ourselves to get yeah. burdened with. It's really important um, to go, yeah. I'm not carrying it like that. I, I, I have a different feeling about what I did and how it went. So let's uh, just turn to 2019 when you go on and you win. Um, is there a point that you felt strong entire way? Was there a point where you, you, know, you thought, no, not again, I'm getting to 2017? <laughs> talk, talk me through the headspace of 2019. Yeah, I, I went to 2019 with a very, very clear plan and the plan was to finish. I didn't care if I finished dead last. Yeah. I just wanted to finish. Yeah. And by doing so, I felt that, you know, by default, you beat 80% of the people who've attempted it. So I just wanted to finish. So I went with a, a, I trained differently. I really went from being training specifically to going, train up here hard, train the body well, and really have a mindset of be disciplined, do what has to be done and do it straight away. And there's no discussion about any of this. So that you had a very clear plan. So my best example I could give was sleeping. Um, my sleeping strategy was I knew with the pace I could hold and the distance I had to do, I could have a 20 minute power nap mid morning, 20 minutes in the afternoon and 40 minutes at night. And that was it. So when you were deciding to sleep, it was literally stop, bivy bag out, in the bag, alarm set and eyes shut within 90 seconds and the reverse when you're coming out. And the discipline was really hold that behavior all the time. So I really went with the mindset of, I just want to finish. So I started on the start line dead last on purpose because I didn't care what anyone else did. And I just took off and did my pace and did my thing. And because of the distance, you spread out very quickly. Within a day, you don't see another competitor and you may not see another yeah, yeah. competitor or a human for days. So you, you really yeah, don't have a mindset of where you sit. And I got to about 400 kilometers in, uh, or probably about 350 kilometers in, and I caught the entire front running pack. These, these are people who were there and made it very clear that they were there to win. And I'm like, I'll never see you guys again. Have a great race. I'll see you at the end. Um, and I caught that front running pack and they've been pushing really hard. And I caught up the moment. I feel really good. I've been sticking to my plan. I've, I've been disciplined. I'm having a great race. I never thought this would happen, but I've got a chance here. So I had that mental discussion of going, we have an opportunity and you'll never have this opportunity again. Are we going for it? I went, yeah, damn right. We're going to go yeah. for it. So I went for it. I just put my head down and said, guys, we're going to go for it. And, you know, best man's going to win, <laughs> so to speak. And, and just spent the last couple of days just driving myself as hard as I could to go, here is the opportunity. Don't worry about what they're doing. Don't look over your shoulder. Don't look back. Deal with what you can do and do the best you can and leave it all out on the field. And it panned out as it did. And how long after did the, uh, you allow the enormity of what you'd done to really resonate? And then how did you personally celebrate what you'd done? Yeah, it took a long time. Like physically, there was quite physically and emotionally, there was a lot of recovery time. Like it really took a toll. Like they're just your, your body's completely annihilated. I lost ten kilos in eight days, even though I was eating six thousand plus calories a day, and the sleep deprivation was brutal. You sleep forty minutes a day for, you know, seven or eight days, and you're actively racing the rest of it. You just you're, I was hallucinating fairly freely. You can't sleep properly for a week afterwards. It really that took some time. 
Um, and I think it really did take some time for me to come home and understand what I'd done. Um, best piece of advice I got is I was walking into the town for the finish line. I was a couple of kilometres out. Um, and a guy, a guy by the name called Pete Newland, who's uh, he competed before, he was there riding a fat bike all the way along the course. And he came up to me and he said, just spend these last couple of kilometres on your own. Tell everyone to go away and just have a think about what you've done. And it was great advice. So you yeah. just tell me, just, just have some quiet space and think about what you've done. Um, so for me, it's been, it took some time to come home and absorb what I'd done and how I felt about it and what it means to me um, to kind of have achieved that. And then what can I do with it? What can I do with that knowledge and that experience yeah. and how can I share it in a way that other people can go out and do their epic thing, whatever that happens to be. Yeah, it's a remarkable story. And, and of course, now you, you share that story uh, from the stage with different audiences. And we'll post uh, the Rogue Scholar uh, web address in our group so people oh, thank can you very much. learn more. And, uh, you know, there's some amazing uh, photography and images on your website. It's a really great book that I love crawling through it. But, um, you know, Paul, uh, thank you uh, for taking the time today and congratulations on the 2017 and 2019 uh, 6633's amazing effort. And thanks for taking time out today to join us and what share is. such uh, wonderful insights. I'll hand what back to CT. Thank you, mate. Oh, thank you both so much. That was... Um, there's just so much drive and determination, um, and I, and it's a it's a theme that's coming across all of the interviews that we're having. And um, I know I certainly walk away inspired. And and I had one writer message me and say, I don't know if I'm inspired or feel like I need to be doing more. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, it right for you. But no. <laughs> yeah. But thank you so much, Paul. That was um, that was awesome. And thanks for the opportunity. Um, I really appreciate it. Thank you, mate. Yeah, it's a really great chat. And, you know, I think um, Pete alluded to around the fundraising, um, you know, what, what we've seen with this challenge is you get out there and you're asking to raise $500 and already we've got people upwards of, you know, $2,000 that they've raised. And yeah, and yeah. it's it's a mindset thing and it's all that mental. Yeah. Mm. yeah. It's the, st the stories that you tell yourself. So, um, yeah, so much that resonates um, from what you were saying, Paul. So thank you. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. And um, I'll just wrap up now with the team. So congratulations on getting to the official halfway mark, 15th of June. Well done. You are now at the official halfway mark of the Thailand ride as well. So you've now arrived at Nana Beach and can enjoy beach and cop. Oh no, hang on. No, you can't enjoy beach and cocktails. But, but, um, but yeah, it's a beautiful, beautiful resort that we that we finish in. Um, so don't forget, jump onto my virtual mission and log your case. If you've got photos that you're sharing throughout, um, please don't forget to tag us so that we can also share and. Um, Coming up tomorrow at 12 o'clock, we've got Mark Matthews, um, so Red Bull big wave surfer. Um, he's got an amazing story and um, you'll love hearing from him. Later this week, we've got Julie Cross, uh, Katrina Webb, Paralympian. So we've got some really great interviews this week um, to help us get through those Ks. So until tomorrow, have a great rest of your Monday and we shall see you all again. Thanks again, Paul. Hey, everyone. Bye, Cheers, guys. Thanks. Thanks, mate. Cheers.